Welcome to the Salvation Army, Cardiff Canton. Today, the last Sunday before Advent, is traditionally Christ the King Sunday. When Pilate asked if he really was King of the Jews, Jesus replied, You say so. The problem with a simple yes or no was that King meant different things to different people. That's why in John's Gospel, Jesus also says, My kingdom is not of this world. But when we enthrone Jesus in our lives, his kingdom has the potential to change our world.
For centuries, Jewish people had longed for the day when a king appointed and anointed by God would rule from David's throne. Messiah and Christ are both words which mean anointed one. A not-of-this-world kind of king didn't seem like much of a threat, so in a mocking sort of way, Pilate could say to the people in John chapter 19, Here is your king. But to call Jesus king in the secular sense was a direct challenge to the authority of Caesar and puppet kings like the Herods. The Jewish chief priests knew exactly what they were doing when they said, We have no king but Caesar. Loving Heavenly Father, we worship you today. We thank you for your word to us in Scripture and for Jesus Christ, our King. We thank you for your daily provisions, food, family and friends. You have given us many good gifts, but Lord, we have our problems too. When there is suffering, strengthen us. When we are anxious, give us peace and help us to recognise your presence. We pray for our world, Father. We thank you for the good news about COVID-19 vaccines, the health professionals and carers, the scientists who are still working to bring relief from this pandemic, and for the technology that has helped us all to keep going. Keep us faithful to you and give us wisdom and compassion 
so that we can respond as the body of Christ to the needs around us. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning and just some brief announcements this morning. Just to say this, that this evening as usual we have our core prayer gathering at 6pm. That is on Zoom of course and the details will be at the end of this meeting. In core family news we're very pleased to hear that Sister Myrtle Sutton is now home from hospital and continuing her recovery but sorry to hear that brother Sid Beach has been admitted to hospital this week so we think of Sid and Pam and the rest of the family at this time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chris, for the announcements. Now let us give in our virtual offering.
Next week we will be entering the Advent season as we prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, the Infant King. But ahead of any royal visit, there is always much work to be done. There is a need for somebody to prepare the way, arrange the route, make sure that there are no obstacles to a safe arrival and to a fruitful visit. The four gospel writers agree that this royal emissary role was fulfilled by John the Baptist. All of them point back to this passage from Isaiah, a voice of one calling. In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. Make way, make way, make way, make way, for the King of Kings, for the King of Kings, make way, make way, make way, make way, for the King of Kings, for the King of Kings. After quoting that passage from Isaiah, this is what Luke says about John the Baptist. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. 
Even tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptise you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist seems like an unusual royal emissary, preparing the way for Christ the King. Matthew and Mark both say that he wore clothes made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Perhaps to our modern ears the diet of locusts reminds us of the Bush Tucker trials on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. I must confess I've no idea what they've replaced that part of the contest with this year. But of course, this description of John the Baptist would have stirred other ideas in the minds of the first hearers of these Gospels. They would have remembered the stories about Elijah, a prophet who had lived way back when Israel and Judah still had kings. Our Old Testament says that Elijah was a man with a garment of hair and with a leather belt around his waist. There was even a time when he was fed by ravens. The first readers or hearers of the Gospels would have understood that John the Baptist was like Elijah and the other prophets of old. This John was somebody who did what his conscience told him, not what he thought would make him popular or enable him to live in comfort. All four of the Gospel writers wanted us to understand that John the Baptist came from a long tradition of prophets who spoke out for God. But the Gospels are really about Jesus, so why bother describing John so carefully? If you want to take on any new responsibility today, you will probably need to get a reference from somebody who can be trusted. Occasionally, I get asked. People think that I can be trusted, not because of my personality or character, but simply 
because of my office. And so as well as a royal emissary preparing the way for Christ the King, John the Baptist was also a reference for Jesus. His manner of dress and lifestyle all said that here was a prophet of God who could be trusted. And so if we really want to know about Jesus, we should listen carefully to John. This holy man says to the people all around who came down to the River Jordan to be baptised by him, and he says to those first readers and hearers of the Gospels, and he says to us also, here is Jesus, I can vouch for him, he is much greater than I, he is the one who can take all of your sins away. Look, he says in the fourth gospel, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is Jesus's reference. Of course, Jesus had other references too. The angels in the Christmas story, the magi from the east, the shepherds, even God the Father, when Jesus was being baptised, announced, This is my Son, whom I love. John the Baptist seems old-fashioned to us, but he would also have seemed old-fashioned to the people who came to be baptised by him. He spoke in ways that ordinary folk could understand, and yet, at the same time, he seemed like a voice from the past, from days when maybe God was a lot more hands-on 
in his dealings with the world. And so by choosing John the Baptist as one of Jesus's references, the gospel writers are saying to us that Jesus wasn't just God's latest idea. The gospels are packed full of messages about Jesus's newness. He is new wine that will burst old wineskins if we don't change to accommodate his coming. He is light and abundant life. And yet, though he is new, he is also ancient. Through the voice of John the Baptist, the past cries out to authenticate Jesus. All the things that Jews had learnt about God's character in their scriptures are now embodied in this living, breathing man called Jesus. And John, the holy man from an old-fashioned, God-fearing, golden age, vouches for him. There have always been Christians who tried to get rid of the Old Testament. The God displayed there, they say, is vengeful. The Old Testament has nothing to do with the teaching of Jesus, they say. But John the Baptist stands at the junction of Old and New Testaments as a sign declaring that there is no disconnection between the two. Because Jesus brings to fulfilment everything that God has done in the past. We have a tendency to disconnect things, to live only in the past or only in the present. Sometimes we are tempted to disconnect our everyday life from our religious life. Or perhaps when we become Christians, we turn our backs on everything before that moment of conversion. John stands between the two, old and new, and says they are connected. John stands between this world and God's kingdom and says that they can be one. He had a straightforward message too. Repent. I'm not very good at remembering directions. I can read a map. I just can't hold the route in my head. I might be driving along the motorway engrossed in a radio program, not paying attention to the road signs and then miss the exit. And when I've made this kind of mistake, I discover that it's not particularly useful just feeling very sorry about the situation. The temptation may be to keep going and hope that the route will sort itself out, but usually it won't. Sometimes my error will take me into endless traffic jams. I should have changed direction, perhaps even turned around. Being sorry, regretting my action is a start, but things will only get better if I am prepared to do something about it. When John says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he is not only inviting everybody to feel sorry for all the things that they've done wrong. This old-fashioned, God-fearing, Elijah-like man of God is challenging them to turn their lives around and head in a completely different direction. What shall we do? Those being baptised asked him. And John said, People with more than they need should share with those who have nothing. Tax collectors should be honest. Soldiers should be content and act honourably. He didn't say you should go to the synagogue more often. He said you should change how you do things in your everyday lives. This was a tall order for tax collectors and soldiers and people with power. How could they change when the fabric of the society into which they were woven often depended on their dishonesty? If some of them started being good, then the whole thing might topple over. He had an answer for that. I baptise you with water but one who is more powerful than I will come. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
John stirred in people the desire to be good. But Jesus the King poured out on people the power to be good. 2,000 years later, this good news echoes through the centuries and lands here with us in 2020. It is for us just as much as it was for the soldiers and tax collectors and priests of old. And Jesus is still King. On this Christ the King Sunday, enthrone him in your heart. Recognise his right to rule so that you might continue to become everything that God created you to be. Thank you.